John's been making waves across various industries, but have you ever wondered how they're reshaping the landscape of engineering and construction in 2024? These aerial wonders are not just cool gadgets, they're enhancing efficiency and safety in ways we've never imagined. In this episode, we're going to dive deep into the impact of drones on the engineering and construction sectors with Paul Wheeler, Vice President of Aerial Innovation at WSP USA. We'll be talking about how uncrewed aircraft systems, also known as UAS, are revolutionizing data collection in the engineering and construction industries, the significant advancements in drone technology, and best practices for integrating UAS data into project workflows. I am your host, Nick Heim, and this is the AEC Engineering and Technology Podcast. And with that, let's jump into today's episode. Now time for our conversation of the week with Paul Wheeler. Paul, welcome to the show and thank you so much for joining us. Ah, thanks for having me here. Absolutely. So I know we've we've been talking for the last couple of minutes about UASs and drones. So I, we've got a really great show for everyone today. So let's just get, get started. So Paul, can you share with our listeners a little bit more about your career journey and how you became the Vice President and Director of Aerial Innovation at WSP USA? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's been an exciting path, uh, as you can imagine, with both challenges and opportunities. It's really kind of shaped me to, to where I'm at today. Uh, I began working at the Utah Department of Transportation uh, many years ago on a survey crew, and uh, which kind of turned into many other opportunities to help me kind of learn and grow. And uh, really, I was kind of fortunate, I'd say, to, to have some incredible mentors who really believed in in my potential, I'd say. They they encouraged me to kind of push those boundaries and think outside the box. And I'd say their guidance is what was really instrumental in kind of helping me develop a mindset of innovation and, and kind of creativity as well, I'd say. And uh, with that, I found like working for employers who really value experimentation and aren't afraid of some degree of failures has been really the key. Uh, I think you got to have that freedom to really try new things and explore those uncharted territories. I think that's crucial. I mean, let's... And especially like the failure piece, let's face it, like not every idea you're going to have is going to be a home run, right? But the the willingness to take risks and learn from those failures, I think is really what drives that progress. And I, I really believe that if we just play it safe all the time, we're not going to accomplish great things. Uh, innovation requires kind of a certain level of risk-taking and courage to fail. And then every setback that you have is an opportunity to really learn and grow. And that philosophy is what's really been kind of that cornerstone or cornerstone of my, my career development. I can talk today. So, uh, yeah, I, through those experiences, I, I gradually moved into leadership roles where really I could influence and inspire others and then help them adopt that similar approach. And kind of now as uh, the vice president here at Aerial Innovation, I kind of strive to, to foster an environment really where my team feels that to be empowered, to innovate, to take risks and uh, to kind of learn from their experiences and uh, it's it's really rewarding for me to see the amazing things that uh, we're achieving now when we're not afraid to fail and uh, where we can push that envelope, improve ourselves and our processes. So I'd say like anybody who's listening and thinking about that, who's on their own career journey, I'd say find those great mentors. Uh, and don't be afraid to talk to them. Uh, also embrace experimentation. Don't be afraid to fail. Those are the elements that's really been a key to my success. And I think it can be a key to theirs as well. Paul, I mean, really well said. And I'll just say, you know, from for any like, you know, company owners or executives listening, Paul's exactly right. Not every initiative you try, like is an innovation specialist is going to be a success, but a lot of them are and can provide a, you know, a pretty significant return on your investment. So don't sleep on on that. And then I would say, Paul, these innovation type positions um, are becoming more common, right? That's, that's what I do is day job, right? My title is innovation engineer. Um, I don't think this was really as common a couple of years ago. So for those who are just entering the workforce or maybe interested in making a switch, you know, just keep your eye out because these types of roles are becoming more and more common. Yeah, it's great to see that the value companies are putting in innovation because they're they're realizing if they don't, they stagnate and uh, they they just aren't getting the things done that they need to. I mean, things can work great in one way, but change is constant, right? There's, you got to plan for it. That's the one thing that you can always plan for is change. And if you're proactively accounting for that and looking to innovate, it's, it's going to help you succeed. And Paul, speaking of innovation, let's, let's move to the topic of, of UAS or drones as they're more commonly known yeah. colloquially. How is the use of, of un uncrewed aircraft systems or UAS revolutionizing data collection in the engineering and construction industries? Yeah. So 
it's it's been a huge change that I've seen. Uh, I started working with uh, drones clear back in 2011, and uh, where a lot of times, you know, when innovations come out, everybody's like, "Oh, this looks like a tool or a toy, right? Not a tool." And uh, sometimes they're concerned about implementing new things. But uh, what I'd say is is how they're really changing it is I'd say first of all, it's just the ability to capture high resolution aerial imagery and video. And real time is a game changer. And then just the software that you can use to process that to create these 3D maps. Really what it does is it gives your engineers or construction managers, they have access to up to date, really precise visual data from sites that were really difficult or dangerous or time consuming to survey. Uh, in the past, uh, you know, we have a project and sometimes we'd be able to afford aerial images on them, but that was few and far between. Now you can have that on any project for, for very cheap which really enhances the accuracy of your site assessments, your progress tracking, your quality control, even I'd say, ultimately making better decision-making and project outcomes I see now. I'd say also uh, like the, the mapping and modeling uh, with new advanced sensors, whether it's your RGB cameras or your LiDAR, uh, creating those 3D models from that, just getting those insights that you can have, uh, understanding the topography, your structural integrity, even the spatial relationships, uh, can really help with your planning design phases as well. And it uh, really creates more effective monitoring, I'd say, of the progress of those. You can see it over time how things are changing and uh, kind of identify any potential problems that you might have before they, they become uh, really big issues. Absolutely. Uh, I'd say cost efficiency too probably is another big one there. As I mentioned, it's really expensive to do aerial imagery. Now we can reduce that need for expensive equipment and manual labor for data collection and minimize downtime and delays. So a lot of different pieces in there, I think where it's helping and I see it just improving more and more in the future. Uh, you know, to the audience, what Paul's referencing is before the advent of drones and kind of the, the environment we have today. Um, and there are companies that still do this. They'll literally go fly planes at 30,000 feet and capturing images with onboard cameras. And there's a number of great providers out there. But in, you know, Paul's examples, right, we're talking imagery while Paul weekly, daily, just depending on what level of progress that you're looking for. So, yeah, the U in UAS is huge because now that you're unmanned, and you don't need um, a skilled pilot to operate a plane, let's say, right? The the scalability and the cost of collecting data with a, a drone has gone down, you know, significantly, significantly compared to where we used to be. Yeah, and even the ability now with uh, the remote docking stations and others, I know sometimes it's been hard to even get people right now. It's it's a struggle to hire people into our industry, and uh, this can help augment and supplement some of that. Maybe you could have these uh, remote drone in a box is on site and uh, it could be doing a lot of that data capture for you uh, even helping with quantities and other things to really augment the existing staff that you have to to provide those up-to-date pictures of what you need in progress over time and worked on many projects and construction and it's it's crazy when something happened in the past you're like oh trying to remember what happened you go back to your daily reports and uh, look at your notes but if you've got a capture even daily or weekly you can really go back and look at that and help uh, refresh your memory and have better documentation uh, to understand what's happening through that whole life cycle of that project too absolutely and and paul that's a it's a great segue into the next question what significant advancements have you seen in drone technology over the past couple of years especially in terms of data collection for engineering projects and if you wouldn't mind could you just expand on drone docking and drone in a box for those in the audience who aren't as familiar with it. Yeah, sure. So what the drone docking and drone in a box is, is think of uh, a self-contained box or, or unit that has the drone in it. So it can close up and open when it needs to. It deploys the drone out. It can fly, do its mission, and then come back and upload the data to where you need it. Uh, you can do real-time uh, video through that so you can see what it's seeing in the eyes. Like right now, Alaska is doing... Uh, these drone in a box is for avalanche mitigation where it's hard to get someone there. It could take them hours to get there if they have an avalanche and uh, now they have eyes in the sky immediately and then you can send the right resources that you need. So think of the, the drone in the box as a self-contained uh, piece of hardware that's got the drone. You can hook up Starlink or other satellite to it to get the internet feed that you need so where you don't have like infrastructure, cell phone or other things and uh, really have a fully remote dock, even with solar for power to, to fly and do your missions and data collection. So that's kind of what the, the drone on the box piece is to, to explain that. And uh, as far as like the, the sensor technology that you're, you're talking about or what advancements there, I'd say it's, it's been in the, the sensors, having the, the capabilities that we have now on 
a flying aircraft that almost anybody can fly. Uh, you know, I believe in a, a lot of good training, but really these sensors, better cameras, so uh, we're seeing high megapixels. And to give you an idea, think of Google Earth, that really revolutionized people being able to look at sites. And that was typically like six, six inches per pixel resolution. Now you're able to fly these at one inch per pixel or less to have really detailed information on these sites uh, to really capture a wide array of data with remarkable precision. Like what I was talking about with LIDAR, even being able to penetrate down through vegetation to get uh, bare earth, stuff that was hard to do before, uh, to get a fully 3D map of your terrain and structures. When I'd survey before, you're, you're taking a point every 50 feet or so, but now the density of our data is so much better that you're getting a better, more accurate picture to design to on on these as well where before they'd be like well why does this look so smooth this in the early days of this i'd give them a, a point cloud and they'd be like well this doesn't look really great it's not all smooth like we're used to seeing from our brake line surveys and I'm like well that's actually what's out there that's what you're seeing and uh before it's interpolated in between those points yeah it absolutely looks smooth but that's not always the reality of what you're there so it provides better design and uh, ultimately better construction i'd say in there as well I'd also say not just the sensors, but on the software side, we've seen some significant progress there in the data processing and analysis capabilities, even with machine learning and AI algorithms too being integrated into the, the drone systems, enabling those real-time data analysis and decision-making. They can now identify patterns and anomalies and even predict uh, potential issues before they become critical too. So that the, I'd say the ability to just process vast amounts of data quickly and accurately is really revolutionizing how we approach engineering projects, uh, allowing for kind of a more proactive and informed decision-making that, that we have. And Paul, it really is amazing the speed at which the technology has moved. And right, AI is huge in um, the news today, but it's not the only technology that's been kind of on, let's say, this like exponential trend, where this, like, it sensors, whether it be like said, RGB, thermal, whatever the case may be, are just getting better and better. The cost is coming down. And with that de-skilling, right, like better drone, better drone operator and you're still going to need some, say like a thermographer to interpret infrared images. But the point being is that it's becoming more and more accessible, which is really um, great for, for project outcomes. Yeah. And even the hardware, I'd say too, has really been improving and playing that crucial role. Uh, the aircraft that we're seeing today are more robust, they're more reliable, they're more versatile. The battery life's improving from what they were from in the beginning, like 10 minutes, to now we're getting ones that can last an hour. So you get those longer flight times, so you can collect uh, extended data collection missions there. So it's it's fantastic to see where it's at. And I really think it's a game changer for our data collection and, and analysis and these, even just how it integrates into like BIM models or our GIS systems or, or even internet of things uh, devices too, uh, how we can interconnect that and really take this comprehensive approach to data collection and project management to, uh, to really enhance collaboration with uh, everybody at Sarah, all your stakeholders that have the most up-to-date information all the time. Yeah, it's the, the possibilities are almost endless. And let's go from, right, like surveying and mapping, talking more about like inspection and monitoring, whether that be new construction or engineering um, inspection, whatever the case may be, right? Like, how do you see drones and the technology improving project outcomes from that perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, I think they're revolutionizing, really surveying and mapping for one, which is the foundation of, of a lot of our projects, right? You got to know what's out there first. The accuracy that we're getting, the efficiency, better models, like I, I talked about, instead of interpolating every 50 feet or so, or even longer, we're, we're getting a true representation of what's out there. You're getting this detailed aerial imagery on top of that from these advanced cameras and sensors, uh, even the video live streaming from multiple angles so you can get that visual record of your construction sites. And I think that's really crucial for precise surveying and mapping uh, to have, again, like better design, better construction, and ultimately a better project overall. Like with these 3D models, uh, like efficiency, I think, is another thing there too. Think of uh, traditional surveying, what would take me a month and a half on, on one project, a lot of rolling hills and vegetation and trees, uh, canopies, uh, where GPS had a hard time uh, even taking a shot because GPS revolutionized what you had from total stations when you had to create line of sights and bushwhack through forests to, to try and survey these. And GPS came along and it was fantastic. You could uh, collect it even faster. But now, even better than GI GPS uh, with the LIDAR, 
being able to penetrate through that vegetation, uh, get down to that bare earth, really collect it quickly. As like I mentioned, a month and a half project, I was able to do in one day, uh, you know, and then process it. So you're talking a couple days in savings. And ultimately, I think I got a better product because uh, otherwise I wouldn't be able to get under those trees. Uh, I wouldn't have everything in the site. It would have been the brake lines that I thought uh, where they'd break at, which are sometimes are hard to do in a lot of rolling hills or takes forever. But this is capturing all of it. Uh, I'd also say safety too is a huge piece there. Uh, there's many times when I had close calls and, uh, you know, I'm lucky to be here today on some of those where people are paying attention, they're distracted and, uh, job sites are not the safest places. And with, uh, the UAS or drones, they can really access these challenging areas without putting people at risk, uh, really enhancing the overall safety of your job sites, I believe too. Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we could talk all day about just the capabilities, but Paul, let's like, let's, let's move over into execution, right? So Starting a little bit earlier, so sometimes changing the mindset or the way that practitioners do things today is not always the simplest thing. But what are some best practices in your mind for integrating UAS data into project workflows so that projects can continue to go off without a hitch as good or better, hopefully better, right, than with the, the methods yeah. that we have today? Yeah, I'd say first of all is probably define really clear objectives. So start by identifying those specific goals and needs that you have for the data, whether it's a site survey or progress tracking or inspections, just have those clear objectives to guide that process and ensure that you're, you're getting relevant and useful data and also using the right platform too. Sometimes people will be just go out and buy any platform thinking it's going to do exactly what they want, not even looking at the sensors and it, it may not do what they want. So make sure you've got those clear objectives of what you really need. The other piece I'd say is standardize your, your data collection processes. So have good standardized procedures for data collection. So you have consistency and accuracy uh, for those, whether that's setting protocols for your flight paths or your altitude or the sensor settings, or even the, the frequency of your data collection that will help create consistency. Uh, another thing I'm a big proponent of is in training. Make sure you're investing in training to make sure your team's well-trained uh, and both the, the flight portion as well as the data analysis. So, uh, that way they know how to fly them safely. They know how to do it legally. They know how to interpret the data and overall have a, a great outcome and not uh, create issues for you otherwise. Uh, the other piece that I don't think gets talked uh, enough about is really integrate it with your existing systems. Now, drones are a fantastic tool, but they're not the end all tool. So make sure that what you're doing and the data that you're getting is compatible with your existing tools and workflows. So, uh, Again, like maybe it's your BIM systems or your GIS systems or, or something else. Make your own Google Earth with your GIS of all the, the UAS data that you're collecting. And then you can use it in multiple divisions, not just one. Don't silo yourself. Bridge these silos and uh, use it in more places than one. Um, the other pieces, you're going to get a lot of data. So make sure you have a data management plan so you know how to store it, how to manage it, how to share it. Uh, whether it's a centralized database or something on the cloud, uh, make sure you got a good plan. And then also make sure you're regularly updating and validating your data. Uh, if you don't know how good a quality data you have, then how is somebody else that can use it? So make sure you're validating that and make sure that you're, you're cross-referencing things and you've got ground truth measurements or, or verification methods to ensure that it's accurate and, and reliable, reliable as well. Uh, Collaboration is another big piece too. Uh, as I talked about bridging silos, make sure you're working with everybody in the division to, use that data and then it becomes suddenly a lot more valuable as well and paul pulling from kind of your last couple comments there large amounts of data bridging silos and when i think of those two combined uh i think 3d models right one of the easiest things for anybody to jump into and immediately understand particularly clients who might you know let's say understand 3d better than the 2d world we're used to working in but how are drones and uas technologies being used to create 3d models of of assets, construction sites, et cetera. And then what benefits do these models provide to the end users? Yeah, I think we're seeing a big paradigm shift from traditional 2D plan sheets into that more 3D world, especially when we're, we're looking at what our machines have with machine guidance and other technologies. And you got to have a good 3D model to be a foundation of that. So what I see is kind of having that enhanced accuracy and detail, having those 3D models that you can collect with UAS or even, you know, terrestrial LIDAR or other new collection techniques, combine them all into a hybrid model. So you get a really precise and detailed representation of those sites. 
uh, which is going to be far more accurate than any 2D plans. Uh, and with that high level of detail, it can really help your engineers and project managers to really just understand the site's conditions and make those better informed decisions. I'd say have better improved planning and design as well. Having, again, those 3D models can help you better plan for that. You can visualize how those new structures or new roadways or whatever may be will fit into the environment because you have that better foundational data. You can also identify those potential issues early on. When I used to run our, our visualization group years ago, it was the same thing. Build in a 3D model, you'd find things that you'd never seen in 2D and didn't think about. So you can find those issues early and fix them before they have to be a change order, even before construction begins. So uh, I'd say even efficient progress monitoring, like I mentioned before, just continually, whatever that length of time is, whether it's weekly or monthly, you, you got that progress monitoring that you have. So you can stay on schedule. You can identify deviations from the plan quickly uh, and maintain that quality control and even creating that living, breathing, as-built model too. Uh, communication, I think, is another big one in collaboration because you can suddenly give this data to others so they can see to have better communication and collaboration. Safety, I think, is another one. Probably drill this to death, but uh, <laughs> if you can keep people out of harm's way, that's that's going to be a big one. And another one that everybody likes to talk about is the cost savings. Yeah, you see huge return on investments. Uh, you could often pay for these platforms that you buy in, in one project. And then uh, from there, it's it's amazing the return on investment you can get on, on everything else. Yeah, Paul, well said. And um, another technology, I think everyone's uh, favorite couple of buzzwords these days, AI and machine learning. Two that are, well, machine learning is a subset of AI. AI posed to be another, you know, game changing technology. Like when we went from hand drafting the CAD and now 2D to 3D, how specifically are AI and machine learning technologies being applied to UAS, UAS data to enhance data analysis and decision making? Yeah, it's it's been a game changer to see. Uh, like I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking, in the early days we'd have to get these training model data sets and train it uh, to see. Think of like a a three-year-old or a four-year-old learning something, then it gets better and better over time. Now that we're seeing software platforms grow, we're seeing a lot of the automation of the data processing. And it's a lot of things that you don't want to do anyway. Who wants to look through images over and over and like look for cracks? Or we, we used it for overhead sign inspections to, to find defects, missing rivets. And uh, that's time consuming. You give it to a structural engineer and they're looking through it, whether it was video, sometimes depending on how... Uh, good they did a job of collecting the video they might get motion sick or looking through pictures is tedious ai can do that very quickly a lot faster than you can do through a person and find those defects and then you can just look at it and do a verification so it can find those patterns a lot faster than humans so it saves time increases the accuracy of it uh, of the interpretation now uh, you can also use it on the, the real-time data analysis so uh, too to get that immediate feedback from it think about being trained to detect anomalies uh, and potential issues in the data as it's collected to make sure that you're collecting exactly what you need to. Or even on the fly side of it, you see uh, platforms like Skydio that are using it so they can fly into these confined space areas and make it easy for anybody to do that. In the early days, it was very hard. You'd lose GPS under a bridge or something else, and then it becomes a lot, a lot harder to, to navigate those, especially with the metal around and the, the magnetometers and other pieces uh, affecting those uh, sensors that are on the aircraft so it could do unpredictable things in flight and, and cause a crash ultimately. So you'd have to train people on that. So I think uh, on the flight collecting side of that, we're, we're seeing big gains too. But to also think about predictive analytics. That's something that not everybody talked about too, but analyzing the historical data and current trends. Think about forecasting future project outcomes, uh, being able to, to help forecast potential delays, cost over on structural issues, all that things that you can do with the data after you've collected it. Again, integrating with some of your other software too, with the enhanced image recognition that you get, uh, think about classifying objects, measuring distances, even uh, looking at structural integrity too from some of these images or even LIDAR. So again, it's not an end-all thing. Sometimes you need to have a person up there to, to see it, but it can help you define it and figure out where to focus on a lot more rapidly. So I think it can be more productive with your time and really optimize that, that resource allocation that you have. Well, I think that's a that's an excellent point that you made right at the end there, because there's still a human in the loop. There's still a trained set of eyes overlooking what artificial intelligence is doing. And I think flat out, right, it's not replacing us. It's just supplementing us and making us better at what we do. Yeah, 
yeah, you still got to have a person in there. And A and I, AI keeps getting better and better. It's, you know, it's continuously learning and improving. So I think the more data sets we can share with that, we can, but ultimately somebody has got to be behind that to, to validate and, and verify that, that knows the, uh, the nuances of each piece of your, your data. So it's just a, a tool to help you. A lot of times, like I said earlier, the things you don't really want to do looking through images, let it process these faster than you can, and then you validate. And Paul, another, you know, interesting use for AI, right? Right. Maintenance and future planning. But how specifically can drones be utilized post-construction for maintenance and future planning of infrastructure projects in particular? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes people think, oh, they're just for the surveying or mapping or, or just during construction. But uh, I see the maintenance side of that being a, a key piece of that too. Now, if you go to the future thing, if you got a great 3D model after construction, why not start from there? and have a living, breathing 3D as built that as things change, you can update that. So I think that's one aspect of it. But I also think you can do your regular inspections and monitoring better. Uh, same thing with the high resolution cameras and sensors, uh, video. Uh, you can look at those, like take for instance, a, a bridge hit. Uh, we, we sadly get a lot of bridge hits uh, across the country to where somebody's got to boom up or something else. And then they have to send an inspector out there to quickly look at it and assess if you need to close down that the bridge or the roadway, if you could have eyes on that even more quickly, then again, you could get the right resources to there. If they need to get a, a snooper truck or a bucket truck out there, that takes time. But if they can see what resources they need immediately and be like, no, this is safe. We're, we're okay. Or if we need to look at this more, let's close it down. That's something you could do. Like you mentioned earlier, the thermal imaging too. Think about preventive maintenance, whether that's using it for delaminations or looking at areas of heat loss or, or overheating in the infrastructure that can help you determine kind of these, these signs of underlying issues. So think of even uh, insulation problems in building or overheating of electrical components or even leaks and pipelines, or even on the emergency management side, you can see, uh, say you have a, a tanker truck. This is an instance we had where it, uh, it crashed and it, the gas is coming out and they're trying to figure out where it's at, where the spots are, you can use the thermal to look at that or even uh, to, to fire too, to see where it's safe to, to put your workers in. So you can help it to, to be proactive for your maintenance team to kind of look at those uh, problems that you have and prevent the small problems from becoming major failures, I'd say. And also I'd sure, say ensuring the longevity and safety of your infrastructure too. Uh, asset management, I think is another piece of that that you can really utilize them for. Uh, creating and updating those models, like I'd mentioned about uh, that living, breathing apps as built. So you've always got that up-to-date record and condition of uh, location of your assets too. Sometimes you don't even know where all your assets are. We we went through that when I worked at the Utah Department of Transportation. We we kind of had an idea, but we didn't know where everything was. So we ended up uh, LIDARing everything on all of our state highways to, to get a better asset inventory of those. And then even below ground too. So say those are some of your pieces too and uh, not to mention safety too much but i think it's key but doing a safety assessment too uh the safety of your infrastructure is paramount as we all know if you've seen some of that uh, in the news uh, as in the last few months of bridges collapsing and other things so inspecting those areas that are difficult or dangerous to access so you can do it more frequently i think is key too to, to reduce the risk to your human inspectors and provide those comprehensive safety evaluations to ensure that your infrastructure really meets all those necessary safety standards as well. Yeah, I, and I think we could we could continue and go on all day about the yeah. use cases. But Paul, Absolutely. thank you so much again for for joining the show. This has been a great look into the world of UAS and all its capabilities. But if you were to give the audience one piece of advice to just wrap the show up about drones, UAS, the environment, what they can be used for, execution, et cetera, like what would it be? Yeah, I'd say technology is always moving very rapidly. So it's going to require a combination of continuous learning, adaptability, proactive engagement with emerging technologies. And and really my advice is embrace lifelong learning uh, as things continue to evolve. Don't get stagnant. Uh, you got to commit to learning all the time, staying updated with the latest industry trends, advancements in technology, the regulatory changes, and uh, with that, I'd, I'd say get a, have a, probably foster a mindset of innovation. I'd say innovation is kind of the heart of what all this is, is happening and the cool things that we've seen, how technology has changed in the last hundred years. It's staggering to, to know from 
you know, the automobiles to where we're at now. So cultivate that mindset that embraces that uh, experimentation and is not afraid of failure. Like I talked about earlier, explore new ideas, test those different approaches and learn from both the successes as well as your setbacks. Uh, being innovative means staying curious uh, and always looking for ways to improve and advance the current technologies and methodologies. I'd say also don't get stuck in a silo. Make sure you're networking and collaborating. Build a strong professional network. It's going to be crucial. Engage with your peers. Join professional organizations. Participate in the online forums and discussions. And uh, that networking really provides those opportunities to exchange ideas, gain insights from others' experiences, and collaborate on those projects is really what it is. And then don't be scared to invest in some of these emerging technologies too. If uh, Stay informed about what they are, invest time and understanding in them, and ultimately make it go. My last piece I'd say here, finally, is just be agile and, and adaptable. It, this things change rapidly. There's new technolog technological breakthroughs and regulatory shifts. So be able to adapt quickly uh, to the changes to ensure you, you still remain relevant and competitive. Develop a kind of a flexible approach to problem solving and be prepared to pivot when you need to, to, to capitalize on those. Don't be afraid to try new things and embrace the possibility of failure. I know I keep saying that. But uh, just remember, each mistake is a learning opportunity that can propel you forward. Remember that change is the only constant. So, so really plan for it and use it to your advantage. Excellent, Paul. Well said. And I think there is a lot of opportunity in our industry for anyone looking to innovate or be a part of a team that does so or even kind of find a role like yours. I'm Paul, thank you so much again for joining us today. If the listeners have more questions for you or want to discuss any of the topics we talked about today, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they can go ahead and email me uh, at paul.wheeler at wsp.com or they can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn as well, uh, but happy to help others. So I think that's what it's all about. And yeah, I really appreciate the time, Nick. Absolutely, Paul. Thank you so much again for your time and until next time. Uh, thanks. Please remember, you can find the show notes for this episode at aectechpodcast.com. There, you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering and technology endeavors. Thank you.